When rebuking a group of Pharisees and lawyers about their rejection of John the Baptist, Jesus told them, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Luke 7, 33 through 35. Was Jesus truly a friend of sinners? Would being a friend of sinners be a good thing or a bad thing? Jesus was a powerful magnet for sinners during his ministry on earth, and they were drawn to him like moths to an open flame. Who were these sinners? In the Old Testament, upon which Jesus, his apostles, and the Pharisees of his day would depend to define this term, a sinner was synonymous with a wicked person. A sinner was also considered the absolute opposite of a righteous person. A few examples include Genesis 13.13. 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against Yahweh. Psalm 1.5. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And Proverbs 13.21. Disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. Conversely, the Old Testament saw opportunity for sinners to repent, change, and become righteous. For example, Psalm 25, 8, Good and upright is Yahweh, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord Yahweh, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? In the New Testament, those who were labeled sinners likely came by that label due to their behavior or lifestyle. Additionally, we notice that Gentiles are generally called sinners by the Jews as they would naturally not be observant of the law and prophets, and would not be faithful in keeping God's statutes. Even Jesus himself was slandered as a sinner by the Pharisees on a few occasions. We have no information about what caused some people, such as the woman who anointed Jesus' feet at Luke 7:37 through 39 to be labeled a sinner. She was, however, apparently known to many as being such, and Jesus' willingness to allow her to touch him offended some. Regarding Gentiles, non-Jews, being called sinners, we see even the Apostle Paul refer to them as sinners at Galatians 2.15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Regarding Jesus, the Pharisees, when speaking to a man who had been healed from blindness by him, attempted to intimidate the man at John 9, 24 through 25. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. There's one thing I do know. I was once blind, but now I see. This was an obvious attempt to slander Jesus because of the overwhelming effect his miracles were having on the current religious system. In addition to those who were frankly called sinners, tax collectors seemed to be included in the group that drew disdain from the Jewish religious elites. On a few occasions, it was observed that Jesus was eating and associating with both sinners and tax collectors. Regarding one of these occasions, we read this at Mark 2:16 through 17. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. With a reputation of being corrupt and dishonest, no doubt tax collectors were lumped in with sinners in Jesus' day. In the 15th chapter of Luke, we notice that despite Jesus being at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, both tax collectors and sinners were attracted to him. At Luke 15, 1 and 2, we read, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. 
And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. No doubt the presence of those considered dirty or untouchable caused discomfort in the overly righteous Pharisees. In response to the Pharisees' reaction to the presence of tax collectors and sinners, Jesus told three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. At the end of the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus said, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Luke 15, 7. At the end of the parable of the lost coin, he says something similar. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 10. Finally, at the end of the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus says, It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Luke 15, 32. The message seems to be clear and obvious. Jesus was extremely interested in the redemption of sinners. Those sinners and tax collectors who had come close to Jesus at the beginning of these parables obviously did so to hear his words. As such, Jesus received them and even allowed them to sit and eat with him. This was something considered extremely taboo by the Pharisees present. After all, it was at a ruler of the Pharisees' house that this meal was taking place, which makes it even more offensive to the Pharisee or Pharisees present if you look back at the first verse of the 14th chapter of Luke. How dare Jesus invite sinners and tax collectors into the home of a righteous Pharisee to sit and eat with him? Yet Jesus' message seems clear. The gospel message of the kingdom of God was intended to call sinners to repentance and invite them to return to the fold. Such a message of repentance and return would be meaningless to one who was already righteous. Jesus' mission is therefore clearly defined. In the parable of the prodigal son, we see that the son who had remained at home and was faithful became angry and bitter that his father had welcomed his wayward son back and had even slaughtered the fattened calf for him. He told his father at Luke 15, 29 through 30, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. In this parable, the son who complained was symbolic of the Pharisees. It was the religious system who had not only labeled people as sinners, but also kept them at arm's length. There had been no willingness to allow for repentance and reconciliation. Instead, those people had been left on the outside permanently. Jesus, however, noticed both the willingness to listen and sincerity from them and welcomed them. They were truly hungry to hear his words, and he certainly did not deny them. So was Jesus a friend of sinners? He certainly was, and he still is. His words at Revelation 3.20 stand as evidence. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. My friend, you have just heard the voice of Jesus and heard his knock. Will you answer the door? Mm -hmm.